All right. Well, hello again. Welcome back to some more uh, more of me talking about physics. Yeah. This uh, lecture is going to be on electrostatics, which is kind of the jumping off point to talk about electricity and later magnetism. Uh, some pretty important stuff in our modern world, as it turns out. So, uh, yeah, let's just get to it. All right. So. To start out with, uh, we kind of got to re-examine or re-talk about some stuff we've already mentioned uh, at different points in this uh, course, but now we're just going to be a little bit more specific because this is really now the topic they're interested in, specifically having to do with things called uh, electric charges. So we've talked about, one way or another, the fact that there are positive and negative electrical charges in the universe. Probably the most prominent place that that came out was when we were talking about the structure of matter and atoms and how atoms are made up of uh, neutrons, protons, electrons. The protons, we said, were positively charged. The electrons are negatively charged. So there are other quantities of charge, but essentially they're either positive or negative and they have some very sort of basic properties um, and well here's some of the most basic things about them if you have two positive charges like charges same kind of charge they're going to want to repel each other so you try to bring two positive charges close to each other they're going to start to push back or if you're able to bring them close to each other and let them go they're going to fly apart same thing with two negative charges. It's still the same uh, kind of charge, like charges, so both negative. So again, if you're able to bring two negative charges close to each other and release them, then they get pushed away from each other. And then finally, if you have unlike charges or opposite charges, those will want to attract each other. So if you took a positive and a negative charge and let them go, then they actually pull towards each other. So in this picture uh, here, with the with sort of the pendulums going on, kind of want to imagine that if there was no electrical charge on either of the pendulum or either either of the bobs in these pictures, then they would both hang at their neutral position, which would just be vertical in equilibrium. So in the case where they have the same charges and those charges repel each other, that's why they're not hanging at this neutral position; they're hanging pushed away from each other or with their opposite charges, they're not at the neutral position, they're getting pulled towards each other. Here we just have uh, another way of depicting that, where you show that if the charges are alike, either both negative or both positive, there's going to be forces that are going to push each other away. Or if they're different charges, unlike charges, then they're going to pull towards each other. And just keep in mind that uh, the amount of force that say one negative charge pushes on the other negative charge, it's going to be equal and opposite. So we still haven't lost uh, Newton's laws where when one negative charge essentially exerts a force on a second one to push it away, that second one is exerting an equal and opposite amount of force on the other. So this is one very uh, sort of uh, basic way of looking at the electric force. It's essentially it's just a push uh, or a pull, you could say, or a, a repel or an attraction uh, between different kinds of charges. And so again, uh, this is very important because our world is made up of things that are electrically charged. So like atoms, the building blocks essentially of matter, are made up of electrons, positrons, neutrons, where neutrons are negatively charged, so we're not going to talk about them really anymore, at least in this portion. But the protons in the nucleus of the atom are positively charged. The electrons around kind of that sphere swirling around the nucleus of the atom are negatively charged. So this picture here is just a picture of picture-ish diagram of a helium atom where helium is made up of two protons. So in the nucleus you see there's two positively charged protons. There's also two neutrons. So technically this would be a helium-4. And uh, 
the two protons, positively charged protons, are balanced out by the two negatively charged electrons. So overall, this helium atom is uh, neutrally charged. Two positives plus two negatives get zero overall net charge. And as you might see just from the picture, the electrons are sort of more loosely bound to the atom than the protons are. The protons are pretty much confined at the nucleus. The electrons are sort of swarming around the outside, um, which means that in most cases, the electrons are more likely to kind of leave or get pulled into an atom. And just like we talked about before with uh, uh, ions, right, that leads to this thing called an ion where uh, this helium atom were to lose one of those electrons, it would now have an overall positive charge and it would be a positive ion. Or if it were to pick up an extra electron from some other atom that flew by, it would have an overall negative charge, it would have one extra electron, one extra negative charge, so it would be a negatively charged ion. So uh, atoms are generally neutrally, or ne electrically neutral, but they can pick up or lose electrons and become ions, as we discussed uh, before. So the fact that those electrons are somewhat easy to, sort of easy to uh, pull off of atoms, or uh, pull off some, atom, or some atoms, put them on other atoms, means that we can uh, cause objects to become electrically charged. So for instance, in this uh, picture, you got a guy and he's got like a rubber rod or maybe a plastic rod and a piece of fur. So the rod's made out of atoms, the fur is made out of atoms. And it turns out when you rub the fur around the rod, what you end up doing is the rod is sort of brushing up against the, rod, the atoms of the rod or brushing up against the atoms of the fur and are slowly stripping electrons off of the fur. So now that that fur has lost some of those electrons, some of those negative charges, the rod, as shown in this picture, has those extra negative charges, those extra electrons on it, and now the rod is overall negatively charged. Take a second and think what that means about the fur. Now that means the fur is now positively charged overall, because it's lost that extra negative charge. So that charge went over to the rod. Um, this also happens like when you brush your hair with a plastic comb. You might notice that your hair starts to stick, uh, cling to the comb, or excess hair or dust starts to cling to the comb, and that's because it uh, has to do with the, the comb becoming uh, electrically charged. Uh, it also happens when you walk across carpet. Uh, rubbing across the carpet, you're stripping electrons either off the carpet or off your shoe onto the carpet. It's not always clear which way the electrons are going, but the general idea is that when you uh, cause things to be charged in this way, you're just moving electrons from one object to another. So this is an example of what we call static charge. Static meaning that even though we moved electrons from one object to another, now they're just kind of sitting there. There's nothing very uh, mobile or uh, not much motion going on after they're already the electrons have moved, now that's where they are, they're static. So we have static charge. This also happens a lot um, with uh, dryers. Uh, when you dry your clothes, the clothes are rubbing up against each other a whole lot, and you have different materials, then the different materials are more apt to either pick up extra electrons or give off extra electrons, and so you'll end up with different pieces of clothing that become uh, pretty heavily static charged. Uh, it turns out that this property of nature, that things can be electrically charged, and we'll see uh, in a minute some simple examples of what you can do with this static charge, besides shock people, um, was known for a long time. It's been known since at least the ancient Greek times. And the word electron even actually comes from a Greek word for amber. And that has to do with the fact that they did some uh, investigations of this sort of phenomenon with amber rods. Okay, let's see an example of this static charge in action. You've probably seen this sort of thing, maybe this kind of demonstration before, where somebody touches like a metal ball and their hair starts to stand on end. Well, hopefully now we're gonna be able to understand why that happens. Um, so generally those metal balls that they're touching or sometimes they're donut shaped things. 
um, but they're metal. Uh, those are called Vandy Graph generators, I believe after some person named Vandy Graph. And essentially what those do is it uses either uh, an electrical power source or some kind of a hand crank or something to essentially push electrons, excess mm -hmm. electrons, onto that uh, metal sphere, that globe. So those extra electrons are sitting there all, are all around the globe, and since they're all negatively charged, they're all pushing away from each other, they're trying to get away from each other, which means when you put your hand on it, those electrons want to get away from each other, so if they can, they're gonna start traveling up your arm, around on your skin, and essentially, since they're constantly pushing each other away, they're all negatively charged, so they're all pushing, they're all repelling each other, the furthest away they can get is gonna be like on the outer edges of your body. And in terms of, well, your hair is sort of the outer uh, surface of your body. And so essentially you get these electrons that end up uh, distributing all over your hair on each stra on the strands of your hair. And again, keep going with that the electrons are still negatively charged. They're still all pushing each other away. And the best that they can push each other away when they're on your hair, since your hair is very light, that push is enough to actually lift your hair up so that essentially so that the electrons can be even further away from each other. So there are all these negative charges just trying to get away from each other, and that electric force, that push, is enough to actually stand your hair on end. So let's see a quick little example of this. So he's actually doing it with a mop head. Right? And he just has a crank that's actually depositing electrons on that metal sphere, and slowly you start to see the fibers that make up the mop push away away from each other. Ah, and he's doing some other stuff there too. But essentially, once he stops uh, generating more and more electrical charge, more and more electrons to move on to that mop head, well, once he stops doing that, there's electrons already on that mop head, and what it turns out is uh, that electrons will then start to slowly leak into the air. They'll get picked up by uh, the water vapor that's in the so water vapor likes to pick up extra electrons, or H2O molecules. Um, so they'll slowly, that, net, that overall charge will slowly kind of leak away. And then he also, at one point, takes a grounded sphere, so one essentially where all the electrons can really rush away to and kind of just taps in all the rest of them go. Don't worry too much about that. Okay, so we've already been talking about uh, how charges will move around, uh, maybe the electrons, negatively charged electrons tend to move around, and something that I kind of implicitly put in there when I was telling you about uh, rubbing the plastic rod with the fur is that when you rub the rod and the fur together, you're not creating electrons, you're not creating negative charge. All you're doing is pulling negative charge, say, from the fur onto that rod. And it turns out this is a it's a universal sort of principle to say that uh, electric charge is something that is conserved, meaning that you don't just out of nowhere create uh, electric charge. Like I don't have a spot right here where there's no net electrical charge in this area, and then all of a sudden, bam, there's a bunch of negative electrical charge. Maybe something like that could happen, but if it did, a bunch of negative charge somehow also would have to be created with a bunch of positive charge an equal amount, so it's still, overall, there's a net zero electrical charge. So as to say, if there was no net electrical charge in this space before, then there can't all of a sudden be a net electrical charge now. So that's one way of saying that. The other way, the simpler way is just to say that, essentially, you can't just, out of nowhere, create a negative charge, and an electron just pop out of nowhere. So going back to this uh, picture, well, I kind of already gave you the answer the last time, where if you uh, rub this fur and the rod together, and they both start out neutrally charged, meaning they don't have an electrical charge. You rub them together, and you find that the rod is negatively charged. Well, is the fur also charged? Hopefully you know. The answer is yes, but it's positively charged because you've taken some of those electrons away. So by removing some some negative amount of charge, what you're left with left with is a net positive charge. Yeah. So 
Uh, we use the exact same terms in uh, for terminology in, when talking about electricity, those being conductors and insulators, except for now we're talking about whether or not a material easily conducts electrical charge. Uh, usually that means electrons. So uh, if you say a material is electrically conductive, what you're saying is that it easily allows uh, electrons to flow through it or, or on the surface of it or something like that. And then conversely, for uh, electrical insulators, when you say something is an electrical insulator, what you're saying is that it is very difficult for electrons to flow uh, through it or around it or maybe even just to move in it at all. So when we're talking about the kinds of materials, uh, it turns out that metals in general are all pretty much all very good conductors. Uh, this is why wires uh, that connect your house to the power plant, electrical power plant, um, wall to your device that you're charging, phone lines, data lines, those are all made up of copper or sometimes silver, um, tin. They vary in how good of conductors they are, but in general all metals are going to conduct electricity pretty well. Versus some insulating materials like plastic, uh, wood, air, turns out as an electrical insulator. And then there are other materials we're not going to talk so much about that kind of fall in between that area, being good conductors or good insulators, which we would call semiconductors. Uh, those materials, like uh, silicon, have turned out to be very important in modern technology, um, creating uh, processors, uh, transistors, but they're fairly complicated. We're only worried about basic things right now, so we're not going to deal with so much with semiconductors. So sort of an example of an insulator in practice and a uh, conductor in practice would be like that Vandy graph that we just saw a minute ago in the YouTube video. The sphere, that metal sphere of the Vandy graph is where all the electrons accumulate along the edge of it. But if you notice the stand that that sphere was sitting on was plastic. So the electrons that have moved on to that sphere are not going to go and transfer back down onto the stand because there's a, that insulator between the stand and the sphere there. Also if you take a look at the wires that are used a lot of times in electrical circuits and connections and testing. Um, the, the, the wire itself is metal, so it's a good conductor, but it's generally going to be wrapped in some kind of rubber or plastic um, so that that metal is insulated from your hand if you go to grab it. So if I'm picking up a wire, I'm not actually going to be conducting uh, electrons from the wire to me because there's that insulated plastic in between. So, this is maybe not actually the most important thing for this level of a course, but because it is such a fundamental um, law or property that has to do with uh, electricity, electrical charges, we should at least uh, mention this, talk about this a little bit. And this thing, Coulomb's Law, which tells you how much electrical force there will be, like the magnitude and the direction of the electrical force between two charged objects will actually tell us that like charges are going to repel each other, unlike charges are going to attract each other. So those that fundamental property can come from this, but this relationship is somewhat complicated for this level, so it's, we're not going to worry about it too much, again, but we should talk about it. So it turns out that the amount, the magnitude, and even direction, of the electrical force between two charged objects can be calculated using this thing called Coulomb's Law. So there's some stuff in here. The K is just a constant number. You don't have to worry too much about K, it's just a number. But the things that uh, vary for the electrical force are the amount of charge that's on one object, the amount of charge that's on the second object, so object A and object B, and then the distance between those objects. Well, if we looked at a picture where we have object A, object B, each of them is charged, 
it looks like they're oppositely charged because the forces are pulling towards each other. So it would be A is positively charged, B is negatively charged, and they would attract each other. If you recognize sort of the form of this equation, that's good, because we looked at an equation that's very similar when we were talking about uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation. So for the universal law of gravitation, the amount of gravitational force between any two massive objects, remember, was proportional to the mass of the first, the mass of the second, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between those objects. So this is essentially the same form of an equation. It's just now, instead of talking about the mass of one object and the mass of the second object, we're talking about the amount of charge one object has and the amount of charge the second object has. So Coulomb's law is very, very similar to Newton's uh, law of gravitation in that it is an inverse square law. The fact that there's two factors of the distance between the objects and the denominator means that the intensity or the strength of the electric force is going to fall off as the square of the distance. So if you get these two objects twice as far away from each other, then it's four times less the magnitude of that electrical force between them. The big difference, as I pointed out, is that we're talking about electrical charge now instead of mass. And it turns out that makes electrical forces quite a bit more complicated than gravitational forces because of the fact that electrical charges can be positive or negative. And if you think about it, mass is really only a positive thing. Something has a mass of a kilogram or 10 kilograms or 568,000 kilograms. Something can't have a mass of negative 5 kilograms is the point. But electrical charge can be positive or negative. So this ends up making the electrical force a bit more complicated than the gravitational force. But the form of it is the same. Proportional to two properties of the objects, charge, in this case, mass for Newton's law of gravitation, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Getting back to talking in more general terms, how might we uh, charge an object or get an object to have a net electrical charge? Well, we've already looked at one where essentially you just rub one object on another. Turns out that when you're rubbing, depending on the type of material, as long as one of them likes to give up electrons and one of them likes to accept electrons, then that's going to happen and one of these objects is going to be negatively charged or positively charged. So that's essentially charging an object by uh, direct contact, conduction. There's another way of charging objects which is called induction, or sort of like indirect. And you can charge an object by induction using the fact that the overall charges on an object can sometimes uh, redistribute themselves. So like in this picture, on the far left, you start with this neutral object, this hanging neutral object, and neutral meaning that it has some positive charge, some negative charge, but overall it's the same amount of positive and negative. But those uh, charges might be able to kind of rearrange themselves a little bit. Not, not necessarily a whole lot, the, the picture is exaggerated here, but they can kind of redistribute themselves slightly. So in the second picture, when you bring a negatively charged object close to this ball, what's going to happen is since those charges on the ball can move a little bit, the negative uh, rod is going to repel the negative charges, so those are going to go to the opposite side of the ball. It's going to attract the positive charges, so those are going to come to the front side of the ball here. So now we have the negative charge on one side, the positive charge on another side. And even though those objects aren't touching, you've already kind of induced this, uh, this distribution of charge, this kind of oblong distribution of charge. Now what you can do is if you go ahead and touch that ball, those electrons, those negative charges on the far side of the ball, are still being pushed away and they're going to want to jump onto your hand. So they jump on your hand, once you take your finger away, now you've removed some negative charge from that ball, there you go. Overall, it's net positively charged. You can take the rod away, it doesn't matter, it's still going to be positively charged overall. Yeah, so that's an example of charging something by induction. Uh, this way you'd say was that by putting this rod next to it, we induce a charge distribution, an uneven charge distribution, and then by touching it with a different object that a, where charges can flow, we remove some of those extra charges and we've left now that original object to be overall uh, have 
an overall net charge. And you could do the op you could charge an object negatively if you do this same process just with a positively charged rod instead. Um, yeah, so there's all kinds of fun stuff you can do when you with charged objects. And well, hang on. Before. Looking back at um, this second picture, where you have uh, or picture B here, where you just brought that negative uh, negatively charged rod up to the ball, and we essentially induced a charge distribution. So the negative charge on one side, the positive charge on the other side. What's happening there, or another way, of, another term for that is polarization, where you polarize that object a little bit so that the negative charges and the positive charges are pushed away from each other. And since the electrical force, remember in Coulomb's law, the electrical force, the amount of force, goes down as the charges that are pushing or pulling on each other are further apart. That's going to mean that in that picture B, the negative charges on the left side of that ball um, are going to be pushed away from the rod because they're both the same charge or the same sign of charge. But the force that's pushing them away is going to be less than the force that's pulling the positive ones towards that rod because those negative, those positive charges are closer. So that means shorter distance between these charged objects, a larger electrical force. So this is why. When you bring that rod up, not only do you polarize that object, do you induce that charge separation, the ball is going to actually be attracted to the rod too. And that is because the negative charges are pushed a little bit less than the positive charges are pulled. Okay, so um, it's kind of a fun demonstration where you do this same sort of process, but instead of having a ball on a string, um, you can do this with them like a metal uh, soda can, and essentially you bring a charged object up to that metal can, and what's going to happen is again you're going to induce that charge separation. So say that object you bring up, that charged object is negatively charged, you're going to induce the negative charges in the can to push to the opposite side, you're going to induce the positive charge in the can to kind of pull over towards, the, towards that uh, right side. And as the picture is showing here, the repulsive force, that force between the two negative, uh, or the negatively charged objects that wants to push apart, is going to be less than that attractive force between the two unlike charged objects, right? the negative and the positive. So what ends up happening is you start to pull the can towards the object, and you can roll the can without even touching it. So he's got a charged uh, PVC pipe, or sorry, right now he's showing you uncharged. There's no net charge on that thing. But then he rubs it a little bit, he charges it. And by inducing that charge separation, we can actually cause that can to roll around without even touching it. There you go. Pretty cool. Okay. So another um, example of induced charge uh, or charge separation that can happen. Very uh, violent and uh, exciting form of this um, is when uh, in a cloud, right, you have clouds up above uh, the surface of the earth and when there's a lot of uh, friction in the cloud, usually when there's hot air and cool air that are mixing, you get uh, a lot of movement. And the movement in the cloud means there's these gases that are brushing up all against each other. And so you tend to uh, get electrons that are pulling off of some uh, gas, part, gas molecules or atoms and attaching to other ones. And you end up getting a bunch of ions inside this cloud. And now that you have positive negative charges, the negative charges will tend to want to go towards the bottom of the cloud and well you'll end up inducing an overall like positive charge on the ground. And it's not really shown here, but the earth down here, right, is the earth. The earth is essentially it's many things, but among those many things is essentially a huge just pool or a uh, source of electrical charge. So in this picture here, we've assumed that 
you start out with a bunch of neutrally charged objects, but since this negative, bo the bottom of the cloud is, ends up becoming uh, negatively charged, it pushes away the excess uh, charge in some of these objects in the Earth's surface. So all those negative object, negatively, negative charges kind of get pushed away, and we're left with um, this positively charged situation on the Earth's surface. Yeah. So if that uh, if that charge builds up, keeps going, and we get enough of that sort of potential between the negatively charged base of the cloud and the positively charged Earth, then what we're doing is essentially building up, it's sort of, you think of it sort of as building up like a pressure um, as you get more and more positive and negatives here, they kind of want to, they're pulling at each other, they want to move towards each other, right? And so you get this sort of more and more tension, more and more and more and more, and eventually you, you get enough, there's a high enough sort of electrical pressure in a way where you kind of break a seal and that's a lightning strike. That's ripping sort of the uh, air and causing it to be conducted so you get a bolt of lightning, which is all those negative uh, electrons, negative charged electrons, just all of a sudden shooting down in a stream to the Earth. So yeah, so I mentioned this idea of uh, charged polarization before. So here we can see a little bit more of that like uh, atomic sort of picture of that, microscopic picture, where if you were to bring a charged object, like again, like a negatively charged rod, close to another object, the atoms in that object might sort of uh, mold themselves a little bit where, let's say in this picture from the bottom left here, you have sort of the neutral setup of the object where it's the negative charge right in the middle and all this, the electrons, or sorry, the positive charge right in the middle, those protons, surrounded by all the negative charge, the electrons, versus um, bringing that uh, a charged object close to that atom, you get a, that positively charged nucleus kind of shifts over a little bit, which amounts to a net sort of negative charge in the opposite direction. So in the end, all we don't really have a whole, there's not, you know, you don't see a big movement of any kind, because it's really just a kind of minor shift of uh, the distribution of that positive one direction, that negative uh, the other direction. So what we end up getting is sort of this realignment or this shift of the charge distribution inside of atoms. If that negative uh, charge rod wasn't there, all these atoms would just be neutral because you'd have essentially the positive and the negative right on top of each other. But now if we bring a negatively charged object close to this uh, material, all the negative or all the positives want to start to pull a little bit towards that rod and all the negatives want to get pushed a little bit away. So you end up with this material that's kind of, we call it polarized. And essentially when it's polarized, that just means one side is now sort of positively charged and the other side is more negatively charged. Even though the object itself is still neutrally charged. Uh, right, so there's some interesting demonstrations of this. Um, for one, uh, we, you take a balloon and rub it on something, like rub it on your hair then you might notice that the balloon has a static uh, charge now. Or maybe you don't notice it. It does have a static charge now because you uh, pulled some electrons off of your hair and now they're sitting on the balloon. So when you take that balloon and you place it next to or onto a wall, you generally are going to polarize the wall a little bit so that you kind of push the negative charge away a little bit and pull the positive charge towards you a little bit. And now you have that um, the overall picture is that there's positive charge right next to that negative charge, so there's going to be an attraction right there. And even though there's a repulsion between the negative charge of the balloon and the negative charge on the other side of those positive charges, again, remember that the amount of push or pull falls off as the square of the distance between those charges. So since those negative charges are further away than the positive charge right there, then that attractive force is going to be greater than the repulsive force. So what ends up happening is the ball, the balloon would generally stick to that. It seems like it sticks to the wall, but it's clinging due to uh, electrostatic forces. And a similar thing happens when you take, say, a comb, maybe a comb you comb through your hair, or a, or even like a plastic rod of some kind. And if you charge that plastic rod up, 
and say it's positively charged, so you've stripped some electrons off of that uh, plastic cone, maybe. When you bring it up next to these like uh, pieces of paper, you cut up little strips of paper, then you're going to polarize that paper, meaning that you'll kind of get a charge separation, so that overall there's a little bit more negative charge towards that uh, cone, and a little more positive charge pushed away from it. But again, the fact that the positive charge is further away means the force that's pushing it away, as shown in this picture, is less than the force that's pulling the negative. So the effect is that this paper is going to want to be attracted to the cone, or that plastic rock or something. So let's see. So here you go. It's kind of a wild-looking old guy rubbing his hair, pulling off electrons. And you put the balloon on the wall, the balloon polarizes the wall, and therefore is attracted, and this stays uh, clung to the wall. Same guy, he's rubbing a plastic rod, and there you go, he attracts a bunch of this little piece of paper. So you polarize the paper, the paper gets attracted to uh, the charged uh, sheet, I don't know what you call that, yeah. Yeah, so one of the advantages of doing lectures this way is, you know, if those videos seem quick, then you always have the option, and I encourage you to pause this video and follow the lecture slides that I've hopefully posted. You can go to those YouTube links yourself and check them out as many times as you like. Yeah, well, the, both of those clips are from the same video, I think, and he does a whole bunch of examples of, uh, or demonstrations with uh, electrostatics. Okay, so this is, well, maybe a question for you. It might be tricky. I haven't quite given you maybe enough information yet. But ask yourself, uh, what causes a stream of water to deflect when you bring a charged object next to it? And generally that deflection is a little bit of a, maybe not the best word. Generally, if you bring a charged object up to a stream of water, then the water you're going to notice is going to start to bend towards that object. It's going to be attracted to that object. So, you're going to take a second, hit pause, and take a stab at it. Don't worry if you're wrong or not. You kind of have to make a little bit of a jump as to where, why this might happen. Okay, so as it turns out, water itself is what we call a polar molecule. And that is to say that water being made up of two hydrogens and one oxygen the structure of water is sort of like a, a V-shape, or a pyramid shape, depending on which orientation you look at it, where the two hydrogens are at the uh, top of the V, and the oxygen is sort of at the vertex. And as it turns out, without doing anything else, water already has a bit of a polarization, and that is to say that one side of the molecule is um, slightly more negatively charged, and the other side is slightly more positively charged. So even though the overall molecule can be neutral, looking within that, there is a separation of that positive and negative charge enough that it, it's what we call polarized. So you don't have to do anything to water, it's already polarized. And what that means is if I bring up a uh, charged object, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what positive or negatively charged object, as long as I bring up a charged object to that stream of water, what's going to happen is, well, if the object is negatively charged, it's going to push away the negative side of the water, but it's going to pull the positive side of the water molecule. And since the positive side is closer, it's going to feel a larger pull, meaning it's going to be attracted, the, whole, the molecule overall is going to be attracted to that uh, negatively charged object. If I were to put a positively charged object next to that water stream, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to, well, the end result is going to be the same. It's going to push away the positive side of the water molecule. It's going to attract the negative side of the water molecule. And once the negative side is closer, the force is going to be greater. And again, because the magnitude of the force gets less as you get further away. So the closer side feels more force, and you actually get pulled still. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what are maybe some of the more uh, abstract details of uh, electric fields or electricity and now we're going to call it electric fields. So I've used the term fields uh, probably a couple of times in this course 
usually, or probably in the case of gravitational fields, when we were talking about gravity, I was I would say you know we're in a gravitational field, and because of that field, there's a gravitational force that pulls me down to the Earth. So the Earth has a gravitational field that creates since I'm massive, I'm in that field, I get pulled down towards the Earth. So the same idea holds for electricity, and that is to say that if you have a charged object, that object creates a electrical field around it. So just like the Earth creates a gravitational field, if I create a gravitational field, though it's very weak because I don't have a lot of mass, um, every object that has mass creates a gravitational field. Every object that has electrical charge creates an electric field. Again, it's more it gets more complicated than gravitational fields because electrical charges can be positive or negative, whereas mass that creates gravitational field is always positive. So anyway, if we imagine that there are fields around charged objects, or if we want to visualize those fields, generally we draw them as these like. Um, you see here, like a bunch of arrows. Um, sometimes those arrows are straight, sometimes they bend around. Um, but what the arrows are showing is the direction, essentially they're showing the direction the electrical force would be, and in particular the direction the electrical force would be on a positive uh, object, so like a proton. So we take some of like the two simplest examples of electrical fields. Right? We have just a positive charge. Imagine a positive charge, nothing else anywhere around it, no other electrical charges around it. The field is essentially just pointing away from it everywhere. And that is because if I were to take a proton, a positively charged object, and put it next to that object, that this positive charge, it's always going to be pushed away from that object. So I put it on the right side of it, it's pushed to the right. If I put it on the left side of it, it's pushed to the left. Push it on, put it on top of it, it's pushed up. I put it off to some diagonal here, it pushes off in that diagonal. Right? So these field lines are just showing the direction that that uh, force would be on positive objects, positive charged objects. So that's one case where you have a positive charge. The other case is a negative charge. It looks almost the same, except for now the arrows are reversed because if I were to put a positive object there, if I were to say take a proton and put it next to this negative charge, it would want to get pulled towards it. So if I put it on the right, it would get pulled to the left here. If I put it on the left of it, it would get pulled to the right towards it. If I put it above it, it would get pulled down. If I put it off to the right, upper right hand side, it would get pulled down to the left. So they're always pointing towards that negative charge. And again, these are like the simplest cases. These are just single positive charge or single negative charge, nothing else around. Um, these are some more complicated electrical fields. One being uh, the field that you create if you have a positive charge next to a negative charge. There, all these lines are showing you where a positive charge, or what direction a positive charge would get pushed or pulled, if you want to look at it that way, if it was placed there. So if you put a positively charged object, say a proton, like up above this, uh, the other positive charge there, that proton will get pushed up and to the right and then start to bend around and get pulled down into the negative charge. Or if you put it right in between them, it would just get pushed towards the negative charge. It's also more complicated what the electric field looks like if you have objects that's not just like, a, mostly we've been imagining like a sphere or like a tiny little ball that just has a, a charge, electrical charge. You can also have objects that have volume, more volume, like a, you know, like a metal rod maybe, or it doesn't even matter if it's metal, but just like a rod. And if that object has electrical charge distributed over it, then its electrical field, we can draw it. It's maybe a little bit more complicated than a single electrical charge, but that's what it looks like, right? If it's a, neg if it's a rod and there's a bunch of negative charge distributed all over it, all these field lines, electrical field lines are pointing towards the rod and they bend in more towards the edge, they kind of more straight towards the middle, all that sort of stuff. And all that said, if instead of taking a positive charge and say placing it next to in this top distribution, if I were to take a negative charge, like an electron, put it in there, well, it's just going to go the opposite direction that a positive charge would. 
negative charge is going to be the opposite. Right, so these situations, these arrangements of electrical charges are what are um, the source or what are amount to electrical potential energy. So I have a positive charge here, a negative charge here. I pull that positive charge away, that's a greater electrical potential energy. Pull it away further, it's an even greater electrical potential energy. If I release that charge, since it's positive and this is negative, it's going to be attracted to this negative charge, and that electrical potential energy is going to convert into kinetic energy, that energy of motion of this positive charge moving towards the negative one. And again, we emphasize this over and over, this, is, this whole situation of electrical potential energy is more complicated than gravitational potential energy because we have negative and positive charges, not just positive mass. So this is kind of the simplest setup. We have a positive and a negative charge. If I have a negative and a negative charge, it turns out it's greater potential energy when I push them together. You think about that for a little bit. All right, so let's talk uh, just a little bit more about uh, electrical potential energy and say a little bit about how it's related to something or very similar to something that you're probably more familiar with. So electrical potential energy is you know, very similar to gravitational potential energy in that it's energy due to the way things are arranged around each other. In terms of the gravitational potential energy, that would be energy due to the arrangement of masses around each other, right? like the mass of the bowling ball being on the floor versus the bowling ball being up in the air. Less potential energy, gravitational potential energy, more gravitational potential energy. In the case of uh, electrical potential energy, it has to do with how electric, electrically charged objects are arranged around each other. So for instance, in this picture, we have this big ball of positive charge, and we have a little ball of positive charge. So these are uh, light charges. So going back to our original thought on electrical forces, they're going to want to repel each other. They would naturally want to repel each other. So this is an example where there's a certain amount of electrical potential energy associated with this arrangement right now, right where they're at, right where they're at to begin with, but if I grab, somehow grab this small positive object and push it towards the other object, I'm going to have to do some work because, you know, naturally they're going to want to push each other apart. So I have to actually exert some force over a distance. I have to do some work to push them together. So I'm exerting energy to push one in, and that amounts to increasing the electrical potential energy of these objects. So here, by just changing the arrangement, by putting them closer together, I increase the electrical potential energy. So this is, again, another example of why electrical potential energy is different than gravitational potential energy, or acts differently at times, essentially because if you ever put two masses closer together, you're always decreasing the gravitational potential energy when you pull them together. Versus here, I take two charged objects, and since they're the same type of charge, uh, push them together, I uh, actually end up getting a greater electrical potential energy when they're closer together. One other quantity or uh, thing that we talk about when we're worrying about electricity, electrical forces, electric fields, is not electrical potential energy, but something that we call electrical potential difference. And it's very close to being an energy, but it's not quite that. It is like electrical potential energy, except for, like in this situation here with the two charged objects, uh, it wouldn't care whether this charged object, the, little, the second object, the little object here on the right side, whether it's positive or negative. So in a sense, it's like electrical potential energy, but you sort of remove the fact that things are positive or negatively charged. Right? So you take away the dependence of that. And what we end up with Again, it's not an energy, it's a what we call a potential difference, electrical potential difference. And it turns out that's another name for voltage. So the voltage is a term that hopefully you've heard before, you've probably heard before, having to do with uh, batteries, you know, transformers, the thing, the little uh, box that you plug in the wall that you plug your phone into. There's certain voltages associated with that. But yeah, so like the voltage of, say, a AA battery, is 1.5 volts. What that's saying is that there's an electrical potential difference of 1.5 volts, and we'll get more into the units of this, or a little bit more into the units of this next time, right? 
but it's electrical potential difference between the negative and the positive side of that battery. Okay, so the last thing, uh, just real quick to talk about, is um, what we call a capacitor. And the reason we talk about that is because it has a lot to do with this electrical potential energy and, um, and potential difference, or voltage. So essentially a capacitor, the most basic form of a capacitor, is two charged objects, usually plates, that are oppositely charged. So you have positive charge on one plate, you have negative charge on another plate, and they're separated by some distance. That's it. I have some amount of positive charge, I have a, a usually, or in the static case, an equal amount of negative charge on the uh, one plate as I do a positive charge on the other plate, right? and they're just separated from each other. So what does that mean? Why is that even a thing? Why do I care about that? Well, going back to this idea of electrical potential energy, if I have a positive plate and I have a negative plate, and they're sort of pulled apart, since they're oppositely charged, they want to pull each other together. They'd like to just be sandwiched together. But since they're separated, there's uh, a certain amount of electrical potential energy due to that arrangement, due to that separation of positive and negative charge. So a capacitor, in the most basic form, is just two materials, one's positive, one's negative, they're separated by some distance. And because they're separated, because they're oppositely charged, there's electrical energy stored there. So, for instance, in the picture here, um, if you were to take two electrical plate or two metal plates and just connect one to the positive side, one to the negative side of a car battery, and stick them up kind of close to each other, there you go, you would have made a capacitor. And if you hold those plates together and somewhat, somehow with some insulating material, so the charge doesn't flow between them, but maybe you just put like a plastic bracket around them somehow, and then you disconnect them from the battery. There's nowhere for that charge to go, so the charge is still going to be stuck on those plates. So essentially, you stored some electrical uh, energy, electrical potential energy there. So a capacitor is very useful, and it's a way to store uh, electrical potential energy. So once I've disconnected from that battery, I can then go ahead and take those wires that are connected to the positive and the negative plate, and I could say connect them to a light bulb, and that electrical uh, potential energy could then become, uh, well, radiative energy, where you uh, light up the light bulb. Can't say too much right now because we haven't talked about circuits so much in current. That's the next lecture. But the basis is that that charge separation of the plates and the capacitor means there's electrical potential energy there, and that electrical potential energy can then be used um, to do something. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that is all I have for electrostatics.